The Morgan Affair, when William Morgan, a man who threatened to expose the secrets of Freemasonry, disappeared. Some say he was murdered by the Masons, or fled to Canada. And today, this is what we shall look into. William Morgan, born 1774 in Virginia, where he was a bricklayer and stonemason, later opening a store in Richmond. William claimed to have been a captain in the War of 1812, though there is currently no evidence of this. He married Lucinda Pendleton in 1819. He was in his 40s, she was 19. They had two children together and moved to York, Upper Canada, where he opened a brewery that burned down, after which they were in poverty and moved to Rochester, New York, and later to Batavia, becoming a bricklayer, and many say here he was an alcoholic and gambler, though some dispute this. And at this time, William received the Royal Arc degrees at the Western Star Chapter number 33 in Leroy, New York. And to achieve this, one has to go through the de three degrees of masonry. It's believed William avoided going through the three degrees by having a friend falsely vouch that he had completed the degrees, and William becoming well known in the Freemason community giving speeches and volunteering at local lodges. However, the Masons in Batavia began to question whether William really was a Mason. And Judge Ebenezer Mix, a Mason, said, There must have been a most reprehensible laxity among both Masons of Rochester and Leroy, for there is no evidence in adduced then or afterwards that he ever received any Masonic degree save the Royal Ark on May 31st, 1825 in Leroy. The Batavia Masons left William's name off of records and wouldn't even admit him to the lodge. These actions angered William, who then threatened to expose the secrets of Freemasonry in a book, and David Miller, owner of the Republican Advocate, a newspaper, supported William with the book to expose the Masons with two other men one being John Davids, his landlord, and Russell Dyer. David had formerly been a Mason who was not successful in the society. The four entered a $500,000 bond to secure the publishing of the book, each agreeing to a fourth of the profit. These supposed secrets, though, had been exposed nearly a hundred years earlier by a reporter from the London Time. William was said to have bragged about the book and the bond in local bars, and supposedly Miller's newspapers were burned, and Masons protested outside of William's house, having him arrested for stealing a shirt and tie. This is where the story begins to become disputed, with several theories being made. We know his debt was paid being $2.50, and these are a few of the popular theories of William's disappearance. The first being that Morgan was taken to an unused building at Fort Niagara after a few days being drowned in the river. Some credence was given to the story when a body washed upon the shore of Lake Ontario. The body initially was identified as Morgan, although there was large discrepancies in the appearance of the body, which was called into question. It was later identified by Miss Sarah Monroe as her husband. The widow Monroe was able to identify various birthmarks and scars on the body even before seeing it. There was also an accusation that Thurlow Reed, a newspaper publisher, had the body altered to better resemble Morgan. As examples, the body which washed up on the shore was bearded with a full head of hair, and Morgan had no facial hair and was bald. The second being a similar account claims that Morgan's captors took him across the Niagara River to Canada and asked the Canadian Masons to deal with him. The Canadian Masons refused, and on the trip back across the river, Morgan was dumped over the side of the boat, the boat. Again, the above account of the body washing up on Lake Ontario gave fuel to this concept, although the body was clearly not Morgan, based on testimonies of the widow, Monroe. The third was from the Masons themselves claiming to have given $500 to Morgan and saying he was told to leave the country. There were contemporary reports that Morgan had been spotted in other countries as well. One report said that they had seen him in the southern part of the United States after his alleged murder. More on those later, though. The media ran with the murder and secret plot theories. 
and due to this, three men and the sheriff of Batavia were tried for the kidnapping and murder of William Morgan. The first trial, they were all acquitted, but a second trial was held, this time pleading guilty to kidnapping William, but were adamant that he was alive. And at this time, the anti-Mason view was growing increasingly popular, with even an anti-Mason political party forming, and many anti-Mason newspapers were created, some being The Countryman, The New York Register, The Anti-Masonic Review, The Middlebury Free Press, The Sun, and The Ohio Register. And by 1831, in New York alone, there were at least 52 anti-Masonic newspapers. As other national problems arose, though, the anti-Masonic party became the Whig party silently. This time is referred to as the Dark Times by the Masons. Many of their lodges were closing, with many members becoming closeted and hosting meetings in their own homes. And William's widow has some theories about herself as well. One claimed that she moved west, marrying another older man and becoming Mormon, some saying that that older man was Joseph Smith. Other in, another interesting note is that in 1841, William was given a baptism of the dead in the Mormon church, leading, leading to conflict between Masons and Mormons. And as William was still missing, Governor DeWitt Clinton offered a reward for info on William Morgan's disappearance. Some claim this to be one of the first pop culture trials being heavily covered in the media, and the men who were prosecuted were Chesbro, Lawson, Sawyer, and Sheriff Eli Bruce. Also a fourth, John Whitney, but more on him later. And on October 27th, 1827, a body washed ashore 40 miles below Fort Niagara, supposedly William's widow identified the body, claiming the clothes matched, but his physical appearance differed from William's. The body had thick hair, William was bald, the body was bearded, and William was not. A man, Thurlow Reed, was accused of shaving the body to make it appear to be William, and three inquests were made for the body. The first agreed with his widow, but the third went with the belief of Miss Sarah Monroe, claiming that it was her missing husband, Timothy Monroe. Reed, upon his death in 1880, claimed that in 1860, Whitney had claimed to him the details of the crime. According to this, Whitney and four others abducted William, bringing him to a boat, and at the boat wrapped him in chains, paddling to the center of the river and dumping his body to a watery demise. There is no proof of this confession, however, but Whitney did tell a story to Robert Morris instead and this is said to be the most probable story of what happened to William Morgan. Whitney claimed to have consulted Governor Clinton on what to do about the book, and during this Clinton is said to have forbade any illegal actions, but suggested bribing William to leave town and to buy his manuscript. And in Batavia, Whitney claimed to have summoned William, putting forth the bribe and possibly along with threats. The bribe was $500, so William would leave to Canada, saying his family would be cared for and later sent to him. And after agreeing, they made a plan for William to be arrested and kidnapped. Whitney claimed to have feared William backing out of this plan, though. And though this is said to be the most possible scenario, all we truly know is William Morgan disappeared. And after the Morgan affair, anti-Masonic views rapidly grew. The anti-Masonic excitement spread fast and far, gold in its history of Freemasonry thus epitomizes the spirit of that time, saying, This country has seen fierce and bitter political contests, but no other has approached the bitterness of this campaign against the Masons. No society, civil, military, or religious, escaped its influence. No relation of family or friends was barred from it. The hatred of Masonry has been carried everywhere, and there was no retreat so sacred that it did not enter. Not only were teachers and pastors driven from their stations, but the children of Masons were excluded from the schools and members from their churches. The sacrament was refused to Masons by formal vote of the church, for no other offense than them being Masonic connections. Families were divided. Brother was arrayed against brother, father against son, and even wives against their husbands. 
desperate efforts were made to take away chartered rights from Masonic corporations and to pass laws that would prevent Masons from holding their meetings and performing their ceremonies. John C. Palmer stated that the pressure was so strong that withdrawals by individuals and bodies were numerous, and in 1827, 227 lodges were represented in the Grand Lodge of New York, and in 1839, the number had dwindled to 41. Every lodge in the state of Vermont surrendered its charter or became dormant, and the Grand Lodge for several years ceased to hold its sessions. As in Vermont, so also in Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and in lesser degrees in several other states. The Masonic Temple was cleft in twain, its brotherhood scattered, its trestle board without work, its working tools shattered. Thus Masonry endured the penalty of mistaken zeal of those fearful brethren who thought that the revealing of the ritual to profane eyes would destroy the order, and who hoped to save it by removing the traitor within the camp. And this has been the Morgan Affair, and how it had a major impact on Freemason history, dismantling its place in society. Thank you for watching today's video, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what topic you would like me to do next, and it may be my next video.